Uh, we're in what the church calendars, they call this sort of season Easter tide. And as Ryan pointed out, uh, it's a bit weird to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus for one Sunday after 40 days of, uh, of Lent and abstinence and repentance and fasting and all the things. And so um, Easter ties is kind of the season where we just explore the uh, implications of the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to do that this morning. And, and especially in light of what the, uh, our youth were sharing this morning, I want to explore that. Um, Eugene Pedersen, who's probably you know my favorite favorite dead saint, Saint Eugene, saint Eugene of Montana, uh, he, he's written a number of wonderful books. But he just really uh, had amazing ministry reigniting really the pastoral imagination for, for pastors, but uh, just a brilliant mind. And he wrote a book called Practice Resurrection. Which is an interesting thought, right? Like, what does it look like for us to practice resurrection? To, like, participate with God in the new life that's bursting into the world. Uh, He wrote this. He says, when we practice resurrection and continuously enter, uh, we continuously enter into what is more than we are. When we practice resurrection, we keep company, company with Jesus, alive and present, who knows where we are going better than we do, which is always from glory to glory. So another way of uh, of unpacking this potentially is is this idea. What does it look like for us to stay at Easter camp? What does it look like for us to be an Easter camp people who just are encountering God and whose lives are getting transformed from glory to glory? Like what that that for me is a, it's been a fascinating thing to wrestle about because I've done plenty of camps in my time and there there is a thing I'm sure you guys got this team talk right where it's like that is not reality and so then you come back to the real world and it's like not fun because your parents are super annoying still right <laughs> apart from Eli so it's like you know you've just got this whole dynamic going on. And, and it's true in a sense that when you go to an Easter camp, there's this whole environment that there's a whole lot of ingredients in the recipe that enable that weekend to be incredibly special. But what if God wants to shape your life in such a way that you don't need to go to an environment because you've created the same environment in your life? Like, what does it look like to, like, I actually reckon that's spiritual maturity. When you... When you're not, you don't need to, like those environments will always be epic and we should go there. But it's like, what does it look like to cultivate that sort of environment in my own life? Because uh, the goal of life is not to, to um, just live as thermometers constantly responding to the temperature around us. The goal is actually to be thermostats, right? Setting the temperature in places where we're like, you know, you turn up to places and you can just, you can, you know, you bring faith, you bring life, you bring hope. The, the goal of our life is not to live a life of skepticism and cynicism, but it's to live a life of love. The goal of our life is not to live at deconstructing our faith, but actually to be constructing our faith so that it is a life of love. The goal is not to live in despair, but in hopeful anticipation of God who rose from the dead and is making all things new. And so we have to be careful around how we, we go through our lives. The reality, and again, young people, you will experience this. Us adults have, have probably journeyed through this, is that you do go through what's called dark nights of the soul. Like, where the heck are you, God? Uh, and you, you do go through times of disappointment with God, where you, where you wrestle with doubt. Our, 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 the Bible's filled with those stories. But they are not meant to be places we reside. They are meant to be part of this greater journey. And so it would be foolish to just park our lives there and say that's normal. There are seasons that we go through, but even there, if we have the humility and wisdom to navigate those seasons well, it's that we would be formed into a people of love, filled with hope, filled with faith, bubbling over with more love, joy, and peace as every day goes past. The goal is a life of union with God and out of that, a life of love for the other. And set up against that, we live in a very real world that wants to rob us of it. That's why we need enormous wisdom. We've talked about this in depth. We've got a whole sermon series on the three enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. There to, like the, it's like a set against the Trinity is this triune 
dynamic going on to rob your soul of flourishing in Jesus. So you've got, you need a lot of wisdom. The Bible's filled with it. And as I say, we've done a whole sermon series on this. If you want to read, you know, things could be helpful, read Live No Lies by John Mark, which explores all those things. But if we're to take this journey seriously of going, we want to live an Easter camp, then what are the ingredients that make Easter camp quite special? And how can we cultivate those in our lives? Well, let's have a look at what I would suggest are some of the things that help us to live Easter camp lives. Number one is expectancy. Easter camp is a time where you go there with a sense of expectancy. You know, and, uh, and that expectancy uh, manifests itself in lots of ways. So like, you know, some of the, the leaders in our, uh, for our youth group were praying and fasting before Easter camp so that you guys would encounter God. There was just an expectancy that as we get ourselves into this environment, God's going to meet us. And so we want to partner with, with what you want to do here, God. And so our leaders were praying and fasting and we had our prayer meetings covering it in prayer and we had all sorts of stuff going on because there was an expectancy that we'd hear some testimonies on a Sunday one day. And that heightened expectation is, is actually very biblical. <laughs> Throughout the entirety of the Scripture, there's a sense of hopeful expectation that God's going to turn up and do something, even when it looks like we're in complete despair. Like the Christian life is a life of hopeful expectation that God is doing a good thing and wants to transform us from glory to glory. That if we have eyes to see, God is actually doing something very beautiful and very deep. Even during the dark night of the soul and the wrestling with the doubt and all the things, absolutely I've been there and continue to cycle through them. If we have eyes to see, there is something, there's an invitation of Jesus in that space to, to make us new, to make us alive, to transform us from glory to glory. You know, uh, in 2 Peter 1 verse 5 to 9, there's so many scriptures on sanctification. This is what I'm talking about. You know, I've been, I've been coming more alive in Jesus. This is, I mean, literally the apostles are dripping with this. One example is, is in 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Now, fat, oh, man, I guess sermons popping out of my head right now. I could just go down so many rabbit warrens, Lord save me. But I'm like, to add to your faith, right? So what's that faith? Faith, so you haven't done anything at this point. It's just his goodness, his righteousness, what he's done on the cross. We receive it as a free gift. Hashtag sermon on grace the other week that I preached, Right? It's like, go there, terrible hashtag, but whatever. It's like, um, so again, we just, it's like, oh, but then I, then that layer of faith, you add to that goodness, and then to, to goodness, knowledge, again, to rest and stuff, and then to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, that one's a biggie. Perseverance, right? So there's this, like, you know, COVID time, which again, triggering for everyone, so sorry, just grace and peace right now, but I'm like, the, tell, the gift of that was perseverance for me. I don't know about you. I, my perseverance muscles went up. Like, because I was like, oh man, flag this for a joke. I'm getting spicy emails every day. You know, no one's watching our online services. You know, it's like everyone's flipping argument. It was just a nightmare for month after month after month. And it's like, I'm just going to hang in there. <laughs> you get this point of like perseverance. God, out of perseverance, godliness, godliness. I love this mutual affection. Like, at least kind of have some sense of like, yeah, you're right. And then ideally finish with love, you know. <laughs> it's like a mutual affection to love. There's this whole thing. Uh, and and for, listen, for if you possess these qualities in an, increase, in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've said this a whole lot of times. I've met too, way too many Christians who are two-year-old Christians but been coming to church for 20 years. Like that's not normal. Actually, we're meant to go deeper and to add to our faith and to grow in our faith. And and the Bible exhorts us in that, not out of legalism, out of devotion. Not to earn anything, but just because you're passionate about Him and you want to step into everything that He's got for you. Because it's the richest life possible. The joy of saying yes to Jesus is infinitely greater than going along with the cultural current. Infinitely greater as we choose Him. And so, uh, so there's this invitation to have an expectation. Uh, you can come to a Sunday with expectation or you can and come just bored already. 
to going through the motions. You can uh, come to our prayer meeting with a sense of expectation. You can turn up to your home church or your worship or our worship. All of that. I'm like, let's have an expectation in our church. God wants to meet us. Surely we can start there. Because that surely is what it looks like to, to practice resurrection. Oh, he's, he's alive. Ooh. She goes, what does that mean? Oh, no, mate. His Aslan's on the loose, though. Phew, but, mate, an unresurrected Jesus is safer. He's alive and kicking her out. And, ooh, you know, this is exciting. Having a sense of expectation. And this is why, even as we go into our 21 days of, of prayer and fasting, I'm like, why don't we have a high expectation that God wants to meet us in the prayer room? God wants to meet us as we pray and fast. God wants to meet us as we gather together and and invite the Holy Spirit to fill us afresh as we do a whole series on the Holy Spirit. Like, let's have an expectation that God wants to meet us. How boring is the Christian life otherwise? Are you seriously happy just to be where you are today and that's it? I'm not. And at the end of the day, the kingdom advances with the coalition of the willing. People that are like, oh, I'm up for it. I'm going to have an expectation that God. And, and I want to say this to some of you guys, like, don't wait for your emotions to, to catch. Like, sometimes you've got to walk by faith, not by sight. Sometimes you've got to choose it, even though your senses aren't with you. And I'm telling you, like, I'm choo- I'm already, I already know what I'm going to do for the 21 days of prayer and fasting in terms of the fasting dynamic of it, but it's not inspired by emotion. It's a choice. I'm like, eh, I, I do want you, God. I don't feel like that a lot of days, <laughs> right? I don't know about you. I don't feel like, oh, I'm thinking, but I'm just going to choose it. I want you, so I'm going to choose to do that. I'm going to choose you, so I'm going to turn up to those, those prayer slots, some of the funky ones in the middle of the night because that's the best one, you know? I'm going to choose you. I'm just going to just like walk by faith at the moment. With just a, my faith reflects my expectation that God will crack through and meet me in a new way. I won't going to go on, on all the points this long, but this is a biggie. I reckon we've got to shake the cage a little of our lives, you know, and, and, and just go, you know what, stuff it, we're going to go for it. We're going to give it a good crack. We're just going to, we're going to just choose to, to give, pray, and fast and do all the things, and then we'll just see what happens. It's not that those spiritual disciplines have been tested and found wanting. They're actually desperately wanted but found quite testing because they reveal the trust structures of our heart do we really, really believe in him? Do we really trust in him as heavenly father who provide for us when we give, who will meet us in prayer, who will break things in our lives and in our culture around us as we fast? I mean, do we drew, and it's like, yeah, I believe, but help my unbelief. Well, I'm just gonna choose to do it. I have an expectation that he wants to meet with us. The second thing that makes Easter camp pretty cool is community, right? BBC! <laughs> <laughs> Right, so the hashtag memories and you know all the rest of it. It's like I love it, and and, and this again, like how do we cultivate an Easter camp practice resurrection lifestyle? We choose community. Like we, like none of the stuff is done on our own. It's always done in community. We follow a triune God. It starts with community. Jesus turns up, doesn't do it on his own. How much simpler would Jesus' life have been without the, the twelve muppets? I mean, infinitely easier. The guys, I mean, you know, unreal. Just how annoying they were. And it's like, he cho- and then it's like he doesn't choose just to anoint individuals. He pours out his spirit on the church. The early church was devoted to fellowship. Like, we do it together. Doing it together makes it more tricky, but it helps form us into a people of love. That's the whole point. Like, you aren't doing community properly until it has annoyed you a bit and probably hurt you and required forgiveness. Until then, you haven't really done community. I don't know what you've done. Some pseudo-secular cultural version of it that's got distance and boundaries. But once, once this thing has required forgiveness and has been hurtful, and it, that's when you're doing proper community and you press through that. You learn to be a person of forgiveness. You learn to be a person of love. And oh my gosh, it's the richest journey ever because we do it together. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful when we do it together. You know, like, lit- honestly, one of the highlights of my week is our upper click, which I have to spell this out every time because, because every time people join us, they hear upper click, the superior click. Upper click, U-P, space, A, space, click. Go up, a, uh, click. So what does it look like for our spiritual journey to keep going up, a, uh, click, as the Holy Spirit invites us? Okay, that's clear. So one of my favorite... <laughs> 
favourite things, we are going to change the name at some point when we get round to it, because I'm tired of doing that. We should just stick that on our website. Anyway, um, but you know, I just love it because I, I go there on Thursday morning and I'm like, I just love that I'm not on my own saying more, Lord. I'm not on my own wrestling with the secret place because it's a fight. It will always be a fight. I love that I do that in community. I love it that I, I get to share my struggles. I love that I get to be honest and vulnerable about when it's been a good week and when it's been a bad week. I love that the boys celebrate when it's like, yeah, someone cracked through and just had transcendent glory happening, you know? And I love that we're there for each other when it gets tricky and all the things. Community makes life rich. So we choose community. Second thing, so third thing that, so we've got, we've got an expectation that happens. We've got a sense of community. The third thing is that camp is filled with teaching, it's filled with main sessions and seminars and teach, you just get fed a diet of the good stuff and a lot of it for a whole bunch of days. And that's really, really good because like how much is our life and mind shaped by what we feed ourselves? And how hard is it to stay clean when you're swimming in a sewer? Right, it's like we, we, we feed ourselves constantly stuff. We're always consuming stuff. There's just news and social media and billboards and five to 10,000 advertisements you're gonna see today. Like that just does something to your mental health. It does something to your soul. And there's something that happens when you just fill yourself with the word of God. So these guys turn up to this environment and it's like, you just got good teaching. That's why my ants, like ants is not some pointy shoed Pentecostal. Ants lives in India and serves the poor. You know, and so it's like, I love it. Like, this is a godly man who, you know, one of the speakers at Easter camp, you know. I spoke at Easter camp a couple of times, you know. <laughs> then, then they have good speakers as well, you know, and it's like they have all these different speakers. Um, but it's, so, and here's, the, here's what John Mark says in, in his book, Live No Lies. Just like we watch carefully what we put into our bodies, <laughs> oh, crap though this is true, few of us pick up random garbage off the sidewalk and pop it into our mouths. We must take great care with what we allow in our minds. And we must take deliberate steps to set our minds on the reality of Jesus and his mental maps. This and this alone will lead us into the kingdom where we will enjoy the deepest kind of life to be had. So like, man, I'm very selective about what I listen to when it comes comes to teaching and stuff, but I'm like, how about we set up our lives so we've got Easter camp levels of input happening? Like, because then we're probably just beginning to get the ledger somewhere in terms of how much other stuff you're just going to consume by default. So like your fate, like you just, you get built up. And like, here's the filter, guys. If I'm like, listen to whatever you want to listen to, right? In terms of teaching, a, we live in an information age. It's insane how easy it is for you to have access to stuff right now. But here's the, the filter that Jesus said, you've got to judge it by its fruit. So what the stuff that you listen to, is it filling you with faith, hope, and love? Is it filling you with love, joy, and peace? I mean, the, the New Testament's got many filters in the epistles that we use to work out whether this is stuff is helpful or not. And so there's lots of stuff that you can listen to that will make you cynical about church, that'll, help, that'll do all sorts of things. I'm like, up to you what you feed yourself, but I tell you what, I'm feeding myself with stuff that's filling me with faith, filling me with hope, filling me with love, filling me with joy, filling me with peace, making me love the church even more, passionate about his kingdom, love his presence, all that sort of stuff, right? So I'm like, we, I think we just need to be consuming more stuff. Are you, I'm, this is for anyone that's been in Bay Vineyard for a while time. You know, you're like, really? You talk about practices all the time. The information doesn't bring transfer. We've got to soak ourselves, man. All the stuff we, we get bombarded with, let's up the podcast intake. And just see what happens. Like, I guess experiment for a while. I'm going to listen to a sermon a day. You know, why not? And my top, the, the person I'm listening to a lot at the moment, if you're like, oh, hey, Harvey, I'm desperately keen to find out who you're listening to. Well, let's, let's slow down, guys, it's, uh, it's coming. No, but my, because my, my, again, I'm super selective about what I consume these days. I get sent heaps of stuff. But um, John Tyson, Pastor John Tyson from Church of the City is my favorite at the moment. Uh, and so if, um, if you're wondering, if you're like, oh, I'd like some stuff, he, he's like a he's like a college he's like a university theology professor means to revivalist. That's a good combination for me. 
maybe you're not there yet, but for me, I love the Holy Spirit. I want him more and more and more, but I've got to have good theology and I, I, someone that knows the word inside and out. So that for me is a top tip. So you've got teaching. Fourth thing, I think, is uh, worship and prayer. So what happens at Easter camp? Multiple times a day, you have prayer and you have worship. Uh, and again, you're just in this environment where you're just enjoying him, blessing him, drawing near to him. Wasn't that just a lovely worship time to this morning? And it's like, you know, we think that we go through life and we're in reality, but then you come into his presence and there's a whole other reality that we engage with that's actually the real world where his presence is close. So, oh, this is who, so I'm like, what does it look like to just cultivate a life where we just are pursuing prayer and, and, and cranking the worship tunes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Kerwin and Liv, I just love, we had uh, their, their wedding, um, just, you know, just oh yeah, a week before, Mr. and Mrs. Whitey, sorry, uh, they uh, we had their wedding, but you know, just was doing some pre marriage stuff, just talking, just, I love hanging out with them because they're just frothing, you know, on how good God is, you know, and it's like, it's good for, as an old jaded Christian who's been in the game for 42 years, it's like I said, it's encouraging, you know, I was like, these people have discovered the goodness of Jesus in recent times and are just absolutely geeking out. And they're just saying, you know, they've moved from listening to Eminem, you know, the hip-hop artist, not the, not the, the chocolate. Um, you know, I've been listening to Eminem. Uh, they've moved from that to worship during the day as they work. Now they've got a, a, a Christian as a boss, which makes things kind of easy. But they're roofers. So I'm like, it's not just them listening to it. <laughs> in fact, the other day they got in trouble because a funeral was happening across the road and they're cranking the worship tunes. But I'm like, this is what happens when you get, when you, get you know, when Jesus starts to invade your life, it's like all the other stuff. I've got, I might listen to whatever you want to listen to, but like there's something about that dynamic of worship that takes us into the throne room of God. It's like, man, it's good. So again, well, how do we cultivate, how do we practice resurrection? Prayer and worship uh, become a big part of our life. Uh, John Altberg in his uh, book, Eternity is Now in Session, says, when we abide, we make a home, our abode in a place. We linger there and our inner person gets shaped by our abode. We can abide in fear, we can abide in ambition, we can abide in anger, we can abide in lust, or we can abide in God. You can insert all sorts of other things there. You can abide in cynicism. You can abide in whatever, you know. You can abide in skepticism or unbelief. You can abide in all these sort of places, but it's like prayer and worship helps us find a new home in God. And so this is the journey we're all on. It's like, how do we cultivate that more and more and more? But it's just kind of like our default is we just go there because that's home. Whatever number we're up to now, uh, I think it's fifth or sixth or something, is joy. Why do we love Easter camp? Because cause it's fun, right? Road trip. Are they in costume? Yes, I think they are, maybe. It's hard to tell. Um, I mean, I'll, you know, I'm saying about all these, in- not really even intense things, these normal Christian things that we have in our life, expectation and prayer and worship and teaching. Like those are all just normal stuff, but it's like, I don't know about you, I want to enjoy the ride. You know, and it's like one of literally one of the cultural statements in our church is that we're committed to taking God very, very seriously, but not ourselves. Take God seriously, but we're not going to take ourselves that seriously. You know, every little window we have for a little bit of mischief, we're probably going to take it. We like being a bit silly. It's like because I'm tired of like, who wants to be in a boring thing where it's just not fun? <laughs> like actually, joy is the serious business of heaven, according to C.S. Lewis. But like this is actually meant to be a place dripping with joy in life. Sometimes it's defiant joy, which I call screw you joy. It's like even in the midst of pain and hardship and like Paul who wrote Philippians, the epistle of joy from a prison, sometimes it's like screw you circumstances. I'm not gonna be robbed of joy because my joy doesn't come from you. It comes from here. You cannot tap. You can't, I'm choosing this right now. Many times in pastoral ministry during very dark valleys, I've been like, screw you devil. I'm having a laugh anyway. You know, so I'm like, it's a fun, it's meant to be fun. Push someone into the bushes this Sunday afternoon, just for a, <laughs> just to really live this out in Jesus' name. <laughs> That'd be mean if, if you pick Terry here, I, you will get, you will get in trouble, you will get in trouble because that, uh, <laughs> that's flirting with the legal lines actually, so, <laughs> yeah, that cane will be coming out in a second. <laughs> I'm going to have a fun walk to the car after church, aren't I? I'm just kidding. 
I'm just seeing the time. All right, we're going to come into Lamb real quick. Here's Above all this stuff, here's my thing. I reckon, uh, and this, this is less a unique thing to Easter camp, but I think it's crucial to the spiritual development of the church in the West, and that's this humility. Humility. If we're serious about following Jesus, there's a humility. The, the Bible uh, is, talks about this a lot, Proverbs uh, about God's heart. It says, he mocks proud mockers. And, yeah, but he shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. God, uh, James 4, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves to God. In the same way, 1 Peter, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. I love this, clothe yourself with humility. Like that's a choice you make. Like that's not an environment thing. So this is separate to the Easter camp thing that's got an environment thing. This is something you choose to clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. And so I've just convinced that one of the massive issues in, in, in the church, which is a big thing to say, but I think it's pride. I think it's pride. And that's why even with these, these um, this 10 days of, of prayer into the day of Pentecost that, that churches all around the country are doing, a big part of that is just to be like, oh man, the promise is if we humble ourselves and seek his face. Prayer is this great expression of humility. It, uh, it's very hard to be filled with God when you're filled with yourself. When you're thinking about yourself the whole time, it's all about you. I want to be filled with him, so I've got to humble myself before, his, before the almighty God. And this is even with... 21, the 21 days of prayer and fasting, I think this is an opportunity to embody a, a humble spirit as a church. Um, like to not be too cool to do this. To not be too cool. You know, I think we care so much about what other people think about us. This is an opportunity for us not to be self-sufficient. We don't think that we actually need God that much. This is just an opportunity to say, yes, you no, know, we do, I do. Help me see that, how much I do. But I do, I, I'm tired of being self-sufficient. It's, it helps us to, to not be the boss anymore of our lives. We love being in charge and control of our lives, but this is us yielding and humbling ourselves before God and saying, I want to relinquish control. Fasting in particular uh, opens me up to the reality of my weakness so that I can experience his grace more and more. It's like I'm, I choose to be weak. I choose to be weak so that I can know your strength and your grace and your presence more and more. Uh, and so uh, I think we want to break the pride of what other people think. We want to acknowledge our need for God. We want to yield to his lordship. We want to bow the knee before the king. And, and, and ultimately, I think we want to learn what it looks like uh, to mature in our faith so that we are thermostats cultivating a life filled with the ingredients that make Easter camp so special, but we're choosing them. And we're choosing to cultivate our life with them. And here's what I want to say to you guys. As much as that was an amazing weekend, I'm telling you now, after being in the game many, many times, because I remember going to, to my first Easter camp and all the rest of it, what I'm preaching is not just theory. It's something you can live. And I'm telling you, I have moments where I feel like I'm at Easter camp and I'm just in my backyard on my own. Or <laughs> times I come here and it's like, oh man, I'm just, it's, the same, it's the same God. He's in the room again. Who is you know? like you, we can cultivate an experience where daily we're experiencing what we experienced over that weekend. So don't ever think it's just because of that environment. It's not because of the environment. It's because of the God of that environment. And he wants to meet with you as we cultivate a life of maturity that see us choose to have these ingredients in our life. Expectation, doing it with others, worship and prayer and teaching and having a lot of fun on the ride, but ultimately a heart of humility that says yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus whenever he invites us.